Welcome to uh, our talk today. My name is Charna Birkovic. It is my great pleasure to welcome uh, this um, exceptional round of CIMIC talks. Uh, Eva Pozo. Dr. Pozo um, is our speaker today. She's a lecturer and senior researcher at the Faculty of Communication of the Riga Stradish University in Latvia. Her research interests are related to science and technology studies and the anthropology of work. She has carried out research in Japan, Montenegro, and in Latvia. Dr. Pozo has recently completed a research project titled Mobilizing Science, Transnationally Mobile Researchers in Comparative Perspective. And she will today present to us one part of, of her research from this project. And the title of her talk is Peripheral Contingencies, Examining the Experiences of International Scholars in Latvia. Eva, if I'm not wrong, you will be talking for about 45 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A session, questions and answers. And then for those of you who are physically located in Göttingen, we will also have an informal session with Eva from 2.30 at the conference room of the Institute, the so-called Besprechungsraum, and, and we look forward to seeing you there in, in person if that is possible. Eva, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Charna, and um, yeah, thank you for organizing this talk and having me here and, you know, creating this wonderful space for, for the conversation. And thank you everyone who is here as well. It's lovely to, to, to see you. And uh, uh, yes, as Charna mentioned, I am um, aiming to talk for about 45 minutes. Um, I will be reading for most of the part because I figured that would be uh, most accessible for both for uh, the listeners and, and, and kind of a bit easier for me as well. But I hope that doesn't, it's not too kind of distracting and, and boring at times. So I'll try to make faces and eye contact. So uh, uh, let me share the screen. Is it working? No. Okay. So yes, uh, the title of my talk today is Peripheral Contingencies, Experiences of International Scholars in Latvia. And let me just uh, start with an ethnographic vignette. Um, so basically, uh, Robert and I, we met at a coffee shop in downtown Riga, capital of Latvia, for a conversation on a cold winter evening. Having told Robert all the necessary details about my research project on the experiences of international scholars in Latvia, I started the conversation the way I usually did, basically by asking him to briefly tell me his education and work history. And he laughed a bit, and this was the first sentence he told me. He said, it will take some time because it's very, it's not linear, and I think it's not even common, which doesn't make it interesting. So this kind of quote stayed with me uh, for a long time and it was kind of a guiding maybe a light for, for uh, this um, talk as well. Because I think that uh, Robert's remark encapsulates attentions embedded in the contemporary regimes of knowledge production. So while linearity may be expected and hoped for in one's academic career, it's not necessarily common. And simultaneously, an uncommon career path is not interesting, precisely because it's more common than the often coveted linear career path. So there's a tension between the supposed linearity of an academic career and the non-linearity and the non-linearity as the reality for increasing numbers of research workers all over the world. So how then does the academic life course play out in practice in the contemporary regimes of knowledge production? And what shapes does it take in national research contexts that tend to be considered peripheral? And here I approach these questions from a very specific angle, that of the experiences of international researchers in Latvia. And in conversation with literature on academic precarity, I tease out the ways the academic life course may play out in peripheral locales of knowledge production. And I argue that in the contemporary academic labor market, research work in Latvia has contradictory effects on the international scholars in the country. While they experience heightened job insecurity, they also find and embrace the professional and personal opportunities that may not be available elsewhere and that are in many ways engendered by the peripherality of Latvia, of Latvia's research system. So um, today what I'm 
planning to do is to basically first uh, situate my insights into larger debates on academic precarity, mobility, and peripherality, uh, discuss the methodological approach briefly, and then outline the kind of Latvian research context that situate the international scholars in Latvia in this context, and then kind of turn to the voices of my research participants. And in the conclusion, I kind of invite you to think with me about the topic of my intervention today from the perspective of mobility justice. So as social science literature has shown, the neoliberalization of academia leads to precarious existence for academic workers. Um, spearheaded by the proliferation of fixed term contracts and the projectorization of research work, I'll return to this later, it takes various forms in different national contexts and there is a lot of, uh, well, more and more literature on this topic. And then, of course, there are care responsibilities and kin ties as gender processes deepen the precarity and also precarity also engenders various effective responses that scholars have also written about uh, hope and hopelessness and anxiety and resentment and so on. And then, of course, in recent years, various professional and advocacy organizations, um, I think that we have heard of the EASA precarity report, for instance, there are other organizations paying attention to these issues. And even the OECD have raised alarm about the precarity of research careers, highlighting the need for reforms that would enhance employment stability. And research workers themselves have also been engaging in various forms of resistance and activism. And Asli Atansever, who is also who's also joined here today, us here today, uh, her work focuses on this topic. So through precarious employment, the non-linearity of the academic life course is thus embedded in the contemporary regimes of knowledge production. Nowadays, mobility across borders is considered an, an obvious part of a researcher's life course. Early career researchers are particularly expected to embrace shorter and longer term employment opportunities in countries and institutions outside their own and are evaluated in the academic job market based um, on their quote unquote internationalization along with quote unquote excellence. At the same time, while these research positions are posited as part of the academic life course that would lead to a permanent position in the future, the only type of academic positions increasing in numbers are fixed term ones. This leads to what Vinicius Freire has termed indefinite mobility and what Sivatansu refers to as academic nomadism. And may be experienced by scholars themselves and early career researchers in particular as forced and exhausting. And again, there's a growing uh, set of literature, literature on this topic. So with my intervention, I join again another emerging set, emerging set of literature on the movements of scholars to peripheral contexts, which are, I suggest, intensified by the tightening, tightening academic labor market across the globe. So um, here I do not necessarily engage in the theorization of the concept of periphery in general or um, the periphery of knowledge production specifically. But in the context of this text, I rely on Lutzai and Holy Lutzai's positioning of the periphery of knowledge production as, quote, countries with a low overall epistemic impact on the global science, even though they might have outstanding individual institutions or advanced industrial research centers. Uh, but I also kind of add two caveats here. Uh, first, um, I follow um, Maria Ivancheva and Ivo Syndicus in their argument that this peripherality quote, connotes not only a structural or material position, but also a symbolic and perf performative position vis-a-vis -vis global policy or core locations that become invoked to justify agendas to implement specific policy reforms, end of quote, which then results in kind of self-peripheralizing practices. I, I kind of focus less on, on, on this aspect in this talk, but it's just something to, to keep in mind as well. And second, I concur with Ognan Koyanich's position, position that, quote, centers and peripheries and relationships between them are constantly made and unmade through political economic processes that operate on multiple spatial and temporal scales at which can be studied ethnographically, end of quote. So basically to sum it up, um, they're both material realities and symbolic aspects to the kind of peripheral peripherality of the academic knowledge production. 
it's peripherality is relation and not static and since there, there's more than one center this kind of all situational and i kind of also um in line with uh, Ogden quench suggest that this um, issue needs to be studied ethnographically so a little bit about my methodological approach um you know the corona times uh, made life difficult for anthropologists and other researchers like for uh, most people uh, so the pandemic made in-person con conversations difficult or, difficult or at times impossible but i kind of follow the spirit of the patchwork ethnography approach in data collection uh, with this kind of focus on fragmentary yet rigorous data so i relied on snowball sampling conducted semi-structured interviews in english and latvian with international scholars who currently uh, work or who used to live in Latvia and also kind of complemented this with more kind of informal in interviews with the same scholars um, in different other contexts. And uh, the discussion is also informed by the voices of Latvian researchers, university administrators and policy makers. And I do not necessarily offer their perspectives in this talk directly, but they have shaped my understanding of, of what's going on. And also my own experiences as an early career academic on a fixed term contract uh, also kind of contribute to the perspective as they kind of posit here. And um, so basically to protect the anonymity, the anonymity of my research participants, I really do not discuss too many details of their lives and circumstances. It kind of, kind of you know, the meat of the ethnographic and anthropological enterprise, but um, I have to be, uh, really uh, careful with that. I do not name specific locations uh, or um, grant names or research fields and so on, and it is on purpose. So uh, international scholars in the Latvian research context. So again, just to kind of uh, have a brief idea of what we're talking about, uh, again, I kind of follow Lutze and Holy Lutze and their position that to be an academic periphery, a system has to be characterized by at least one of the four following relatively easy to measure indicators, uncompetitive salaries, low research allowances, language barrier and cultural clash between national academic culture and global academia. And Latvia in many ways kind of fits this uh, description. A little bit about the Latvia. So country of 1.9 million people in the European East, you can see underlined with yellow, um, uh, regained independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, joined the EU in 2004, and is a Euro country since 2014. And in the current geopolitical um, context, uh, it's important, I guess, to note that Latvia is a NATO member as well since 1999. So, um, so that's Latvia as a kind of comparatively small uh, research system, but with big aspirations that are coming out in many ways in various policy documents. So as Liana Ozovalinja in a forthcoming article posits, since regaining independence from the Soviet Union in 1999, 1991, Latvia has undergone several phases in trying to find its place in the global hierarchies of knowledge production. From narratives of democratization and westernization to those of knowledge economy and innovation, and more recently to an emphasis on internationalization and global excellence. Due to various structural reforms, higher education and research have become increasingly integrated with quantifiable research output posited as a measure for evaluating the worth of both research institutions and employees. And again, it's nothing necessarily unique to Latvia. Um, Maria Ivancheva has written or talked a lot about on, on how the labor of teaching is being diskilled and devalued as institutions increasingly focus on research as the kind of important part of academic work. And uh, at the same time, in 2020, only 0.7% of uh, the country's GDP were allocated for research and development. There were um, plans to increase it to 1.5% of, of GDP by 2023 or 2024, but um, 
I don't think that it's going to happen. And uh, while there are ongoing efforts to increase base salaries for research workers, there has been strong discursive emphasis on the necessity for research institutions and research workers to attract research grant funding, epitomized by but not limited to funding offered by the European Union. Therefore, the, the importance of Latvia joining the EU and therefore joining all the kind of uh, funding uh, options made av available by, by the Union. So this means that the academic knowledge production in Latvia is characterized by what Chadna Berkovic calls projectorization. So projectorization um, is a process of organizing the production of scientific knowledge through project cycles that generate projectariat. An increasing number of precariously, precariously employed scholars were also privileged due to their relatively high salaries. And in the case of Latvia, um, this, Projectorization plays out as the, as the necessity for research workers to remain constantly vigilant for grant funding opportunities because the base salaries are so low. And also because if you do not get, there are occasions when if you do not get the, the grant funding, you lose the position as well. So in the Latvian context where base sal salaries are low, one's livelihood may quite li literally depend on whether a project application is successful or not. The, divis the, the division of grants, grant funding cycle winners and losers um, is particularly stark. So, and in recent years, um, the knowledge production system in Latvia is also characterized by policymaker concerns about the lack of research workers in the country and the low numbers of new PhD holders. And I put the lack in the question mark here because again, it's a kind of a, a complicated issue because these concerns need to be situated within the larger, again, context of uh, projectorization, for instance. So most doctoral students in the country do not have structured and predictable funding support for, to, to support their studies. And, you know, to, if everything depends on grant funding, people may start their PhD programs and drop out and uh, not, not everyone's interested in paying for their study. At the same time, the lack of workers for longer, shorter, and fixed term positions funded by acquired research grants mean that international scholars have entry points into the Latvian research system. Um, and uh, it's also important to note that in line with other peripheral contexts, only um, around 3.2% of employees in, in research and higher education uh, institutions in Latvia are international scholars. So now I turn to the examination of their experiences working in Latvia. So um, Mimi Scheller in her, in her discussion on mobility justice writes that, quote, everything including movement is contingent on other moves, end of quote. Um, and I will return to the question of justice and mobility justice towards the end of the talk. But uh, for now, I just want to kind of borrow this idea of uh, content contingency so that one move is dependent on all kinds of other movements. And I focus on what may be referred to as the experience of contingency, by which I mean that the ways international scholars in Latvia make sense of their positionality in Latvian higher education and research institutions. While not necessarily described as such, Contingency emerges in my research participants' stories of their presence and employment in Latvia, a pattern shared by international scholars in other peripheral contexts of knowledge production as well. Uh, my interlocutors listed various key moments and elements in their arrival and work at Latvian institutions, let's say from personal relationships to professional networks, from lucky encounters with their future bosses at international conferences to fruitful exchanges started by cold emailing, and all these processes, again, taking place in a tight global job market. That, that's what we have to kind of keep in mind all the time. And for most of my interlocutors, their positions in Latvian higher education and research institutions were not their first PhD, were not their first post PhD contracts. Many had worked in several institutions on fixed term contracts in various parts of the world before moving to Latvia and taking up jobs there. And here I kind of make a distinction between three, three loosely defined and intersecting groups of scholars. 
those who arrived in the country around mid 2000s, those who followed grant funding, once these kind of uh, grant opportunities were uh, made uh, more available and kind of uh, became in many ways kind of uh, the driving force um, between, be, behind the research production material, and those driven by kin and other personal ties. So I first uh, discuss the first group. The opportunities were real, and you'll see why, why <laughs> uh, I have chosen this quote. So turn to the voices of my interlocutors. And um, the first one is Gabriel. And Gabriel had first arrived in Latvia in the mid 2000s as a doctoral student around 2005, 2006. After that, he worked in different locations in Europe and North America, and at one point decided to build his professional life in Latvia. While Gabriel's, Gabriel's initial, initial arrival was a matter of contingency. So basically he, for his PhD, um, uh, for his degree program, he had to implement like a small project in uh, one of the countries in the European East. He contacted several uh, institutions and people in various countries. The Latvians seemed to be uh, the most kind of welcoming. So he basically uh, went to Latvia and started collaborating with people there. Um, so there was this kind of matter of contingency, but his decision to li live and work in Latvia was quite conscious afterwards. After all, it involved, as he put it, building extensive local networks. There's people on whom he may rely on if an employment contract did not work out. And Gabriel was very aware that his former colleagues in, in, in Western Europe and in North America were, um, did not understand his decision to uh, to stay and work in Latvia, but as he put it, he had put, privileged his quality of life over his professional career. And here um, he's, he means professional career as imagined in the linear academic career model that also presupposes to desire, the desire to move to the centers of academic knowledge production rather than periphery. And there were all kinds of factors here because Gabriel felt that there was certain openness to professional opportunities in Latvia that allowed him to focus not only on the production of peer-reviewed articles, but also societal impact through various public initiatives. Uh, for instance, he was very proud that he, um, he, when he had arrived as a PhD student, he had been involved in organizing a conference that was attended by like influential policymakers. And as he put it, one third of the parliament was there. You know, he, he felt that his work had societal impact and he was a visible person in this in the country and he also felt that there's uh, as, he, as he put it the potential for an egalitarian society um, in in latvia and uh, he also enjoyed the parks in riga and the proximity to the baltic sea so what i want to suggest here is that the experience of gabriel reflects um, those of the scholars who have had ties with latvia in the first decade of the 2000s. So they had arrived in the country during the period when Latvia was trying to catch up with the West, using it in quotes, and again, Europeanize itself in various spheres of life, having recently joined the European Union, including the higher education and research sector, and the desire to align the country's development with that of Europe also provided scholars like Gabriel with degrees from university in the West with the, with the opportunity to enter the academic labor market in Latvia and also to kind of assume the role of um, public intellectuals. And um, this is a long quote, but um, I'll just kind of talk over it. Um, and th this kind of truly um, comes out in Martin's story because Martin, he had arrived in Latvia as a comparatively freshly minted PhD in his in the mid 2000s. He had been first invited as a visiting lecturer by a scholar from Latvia who was visiting his institution in Western Europe and was looking for somebody, anybody basically, who would be interested in going to Latvia for a couple of weeks and teaching a course and not even getting paid for it. I think he said he, he had to get extra funding from his university um, to, to go to Latvia and uh, basically pay. Yeah, he wasn't getting paid for his job. Uh, but he liked it there, um, and over time, 
he was asked to assume much greater responsibilities at the Latvian institution, at the Latvian institution with which he had become affiliated. And it's quite telling um, that, as you can see, he refers to this move as a kind of rebirth. And at the time of our conversation, he had truly had unpleasant, he had had truly unpleasant experiences in at the Latvian institution and he was no longer working there and uh, things were not necessarily good. But despite the multitude of issues he encountered later over the years trying to decipher his work contracts, relationships with colleagues and higher ups, as, as well as his place in the Latvian academic system in general, Martin felt that his initial decision to work in Latvia opened up professional opportunities and networks internationally as well that may have remained him close, that may have remained close to him otherwise. Because in Latvia, he was invited to build something new and he was invited to represent um, his institution and professional associations. He was no longer one of uh, thousands of researchers. He was, again, somebody, um, you know, with a name, somebody who was known, somebody uh, who was important. Um, yes, so along with the shift in Latvian, in Latvian research policies towards internationalization and global competitiveness and, and quantifiable research assessment from the 2010s onwards, the entrance of international scholars in Latvia started to take a different, more kind of structured shape, basically based on the availability of international local grant funding and with an eye on increasing publication metrics. Employment offers tend to be contingent upon grant funding, at least for the initial fixed term positions available for, for international scholars. And the contingent nonlinearities here are different than those of the scholars who had arrived in Latvia in the mid 2000s, um, but they're present nonetheless. So the stance of both the receiving institutions and the international scholars hired is more kind of calculated and with institutions aiming to secure labor in order to meet specific research goals, usually research goals, not teaching goals, because, you know, the, again, the quantifiable metrics of, of uh, how we evaluate uh, research and excellence, all these uh, words. And, uh, and, and, uh, with early career researchers and navigating these circumstances to meet their own needs within a precarious labor market. So for instance, Astrid was happy when her former mentor had introduced her to his colleagues in Latvia and suggested her to apply for a grant to carry out her research project in Latvia. Having previously worked on fixed term contracts in different parts of the world, Astrid was quite excited to get the grant and a job in Latvia, which had two major advantages. Basically, it was closer to her home country and um, had a longer contract than her previous position. So she was telling me a story of how her previous position, because um, she had a child, but her partner lived in their home country, um, that she would, if she had a conference, she would have to first fly to her home country, leave the kid, uh, with her relatives, then fly to the conference. After the conference, go back to her home country, pick up the kid, and go back. Go back to the work, to the place where she lived. So, being closer to home meant that it was easier for her to maintain kin ties and take care of parenting responsibilities together with her partner, who had not accompanied her to Latvia. And having contract for several years instead of months, which she had been used to by that point, uh, meant that what, as she put it, better sense of security and stability. And it's good for a career, so you don't have to think about what will happen in six months or something. So basically the assumption was that, you know, that the working period of contract is six months or something, and the three years is uh, something already um, to be happy about. And while aware of some shortcomings at her Latvian institution and the fact that for the institution, her work was a means to reach their own goals within the country's research landscape, Astrid was quite content because her position provided her with the opportunity to achieve both her professional and personal objectives. So another insight um, into these kind of opportunities um, can be glimpsed from Ivan's narrative. Um, so Ivan, having received his doctoral degree in his home country in Europe, uh, Ivan had decided to apply for a well-known EU-wide research grant to carry out a research project in a different 
country. It's like a collaborative project. He felt that at home, due to, as he put, quite strict research hierarchies, it was not easy to establish oneself as a scientist. So he had contacted several institutions in Europe to list as his collaborators for the grant, and he liked the enthusiasm of the potential colleagues in Latvia most. And, and he was his application was successful, and he basically att attributed the success of um, their application precisely to the fact that he had applied to work with a Latvian kind of a peripheral institution uh, which was uh, lacking um, in resources and material resources and then everyone had to be kind of more uh, they had to find more they had to be more kind of uh, uh, you know creative and ingenious and collaborative in in the ways that they uh, thought about uh, research work. So, and you can see what, how he describes this process. And for even that the professional opportunities offered by work in Latvia lie precisely in the peripherality of the country's system of knowledge production. As he put it, it's much easier to start something in Latvia because the necessity to fight a bit more, to be creative and collaborative in a context where resources are not easily available. So, well, Ivan's continued work in Latvia is both enabled and made precarious by the projectorization of knowledge production. He sees the comparatively fragile research infrastructure in the country as an opportunity to build his own career and to do so in a collaborative and innovative and also meaningful ways. He, he really thought that his work needed to be meaningful. Um, at the same time, again, it's, it's crucial to remember that despite the places and opportunity that researchers carve for themselves in Latvia, the broader context of the precarious labor market is what may drive researchers to accept positions in such peripheral contexts of knowledge production as Latvia in the first place. So, um, kind of Ruslan's story highlights this factor. Um, Upon meeting his future boss at a conference, Ruslan had accepted a postdoctoral, postdoctoral research position in Latvia soon after graduating from his doctoral program in another European country. At the time, he had no plans of staying in Latvia, and once the contract ended, he acquired another fixed-term contract on a different con continent. He was super happy about it and um, hopeful for the future. And as Ruslan put it, I thought I would never come back. And, uh, but once that other contract ended and other job applications did not work out, he got in touch with his former supervisor in Latvia and rejoined the research group because their supervisor had grant funding for another team member for a certain amount of time. time. And Ruslan made the best of this. Um, uh, he's now a com in a comparatively secure position at his institution in Latvia. He has his own research funding uh, opportunities, again, to do work that he considers important. But looking back at his return to Latvia, he said, I decided to stay in Latvia because I couldn't find a job. Otherwise, my plan wasn't to stay in Latvia. So, um, the experiences of scholars who have personal ties, such as uh, partners in Latvia, uh, provide another insight into the specific shapes that the contingencies of the academic life course may take in peripheral contexts. Um, so being rooted in a country is not compatible with academic nomadism or it's kind of indefinite mobility. And uh, that is kind of expected in the contemporary regimes of knowledge production. And making the decision to live in Latvia for personal reasons and trying to find one's place within the country's research system kind of further highlights the I don't know, serendipities and contingencies involved in building one's academic life course and also the regimes that govern research work. And um, here, of course, it's important to keep in mind that uh, my interlocutors, there were people who had been able to make it happen, right? Who had found employment at higher education and research institutions in Latvia, even as they had entered the country to join their partners or following other kin obligations rather than following grant funding. So for instance, Diego. Diego had arrived in Latvia as a tourist while on a break from his fixed term research position in a neighboring country. Um, during his visit, during this visit, visit, he met the person who became his partner and for whom Diego decided to move to Latvia. 
a friend of the sister of his partner had told him that one of the institutions in Latvia was hiring in his field. These kind of job announcements are not easily uh, available and kind of accessible. Um, and uh, Diego applied for the job, got it, and was encouraged and supported to apply for additional grant money to fund his position. And uh, while he was able to secure a research job at the end, it had not been an easy process. He had contacted other institutions in Latvia, but had either received no response or been told that, uh, would that he would have to be proficient in the Latvian language to be hired. And uh, there's another um, whole uh, topic on um, how uh, linguistic nationalism in Latvia basically plays out in these research contexts and uh, how it affects research workers, but that's for a different conversation. So, and later I talked to the head of the institution where Diego worked. Uh, she was one of the people who talked a lot about the lack of research workers in the country, the lack of the research workers in her institution, and she had been ready to like really welcome Diego with open arms because at that point at, at, at her institution, there really was a lack of uh, workers uh, for these kind of positions opened up by um, grant money. For Sarah, the entry, entry into, the current, into her current research job in Latvia was facilitated by her partner. Sarah had met the partner, partner at a research institution where she worked and the partner was a visiting scholar. And having visited Latvia during their, as they were dating, Sarah decided that she would enjoy living in Latvia as it was different from the urban environment to which she was used. And following her move to Latvia, Sarah was able to continue her work remotely for some time until her organization was restructured and position eliminated. Uh, then it was her partner who was able to provide her with the necessary introductions and tips to apply for a job at the higher education research institution in Latvia, first as a part-time lecturer and then as a researcher as well. For Sarah's then, it was both her partner and the internationalization of higher education in Latvia uh, that opened up the opportunity for her to teach in English and, English and then join a research team at the same institution. And when I say... Um, internationalization of higher education in Latvia, I, um, I mean that, that there's an ambivalent attitude in general to um, welcoming international scholars in Latvia, but uh, the attitude is super welcoming when it comes to international students simply because they, they bring money. And I see that I'm kind of running out of time a bit. So I just want to basically quickly uh, note uh, the Olga's case. In Olga's case, um, her opportunity was that it was easier for her, her to gain her uh, current academic title in Latvia um, than it would have been in, in other contexts. So she said in other Western countries epitomized by the United States in her case. So basically, uh, Latvia provided the opportunity for her to get the uh, get the academic title that would have taken uh, more time and effort, maybe in other contexts. So, okay. So, in the final part here, I really kind of invite you to think with me in trying to conceptualize these experiences further, and. To sum it up, I have shown um, a specific configuration the projectorization of knowledge production may take in peripheral, peripheral research contexts. And my interlocutors are workers in an increasingly uncompetitive academic labor market globally, and at the same time participants in um, peripheral research system locally. And due to this positionality, they encounter both kind of global and country specific insecurities. And of course, there are all kinds of institutional level uncertainties as well when it comes to finding and retaining jobs. They encounter this uncertainty through, for instance, network building and investments or personal resources in attaining research goals. And at the same time, through work in Latvia, they also find both professional and personal opportunities. And depending on the time and conditions of their, of their arrival in Latvia, the opportunities may take different forms, from a chance to take up the visible role of a public intellectual, to strategic grant acquisition and career planning, um, from geographical considerations to finding an acceptable balance between professional and personal life. 
and the opportunities are as real as they can be in the broader context that I have discussed today. And it's precisely kind of the peripherality of the Latvian research context that enables them. So <clears throat> mobility justice, this is the part that I really kind of uh, invite you to think with me as I'm trying to figure this part out. So I now turn to what Mimi Scheller refers to as mobility justice to further consider both the positionality of international scholars in Latvia and the transnational movements of research work. conceptually. Mobility justice is an overarching concept for thinking about how power and inequality inform the governance and control of movement, shaping the patterns of unequal mobility and immobility in the circulation of people, resources, and information. And her departure for treating justice as situational and embedded in movements in movement stems from the perspective that, quote, most theories of justice have been sedentary, meaning that they treat their object as an ontologically stable or pre-existing thing, which stands still before it is put into motion, end of quote. Scholars thus argues for the necessity to focus in social analysis in, on the, quote, relations, resonances, connections, continuities, and disruptions that organize the world into ongoing yet temporary mobile formations, end of quote. And for her, mobility injustice, justice or injustice may occur on any scale, including for the purposes of this talk, uh, that of transnational movements. But for her, for, for Scheller, it's about, you know, this kind of uh, movements in urban spaces to uh, transnational movements to um, climate emergency and these kinds of, uh, like at, at every level, you can think of mobility through from the perspective of uh, mobility, justice or injustice. So transnational movements of research workers from one fixed term position to another um, usually are not kind of approached from the perspective of justice directly. It's, it's kind of implied there, but, but it's not directly kind of uh, uh, approached this way. And I suggest that um, in the context of the neoliberalization of projectorization of knowledge production, a focus on justice is crucial in understanding movements across borders as part of this kind of nonlinear academic life course. And um, today I kind of did not discuss the kind of most visible and quite real mobility injustices in the Latvian research context, even among my interlocutors, for instance, the that the Latvia's, for instance, mobility regime has an exhausting effect on researchers who are third country nationals, quote unquote, and especially people from the global east or uh, global south. And I have also not discussed, no, not focused on the equally important gender dimension of the research mobility imperative. The mobility injustice that I have tried to emphasize here is the profoundly tied to the projectorization of uh, knowledge production. And, um, Charna Borkovic suggests that the projectorization of research means that, quote, many researchers who pursue careers throughout Europe may find themselves in the gaps of a fractured and uneven space of European academia, end of quote. And while her discussion focuses on anthropologists working in Europe, her arg argument can be applied to researchers working in other disciplines as well, that the, the non-linearity of one's academic career characterized by fixed term contracts and indefinite mobility may cause researchers to end up in gaps and created also by particular forms of uh, the governments of movement. And the academic life course and the experience of nonlinearity as part of it is profoundly intertwined with this, all kinds of policy dreams and aspirations that they, I, I think I tried to kind of uh, show in this um, presentation as well. And the movements, um, and on the other side of the same coin, lack thereof, of research workers are enabled and shaped by regimes of governance, mobility, and mobility, mobility governance. And in this context, uh, it's crucial to keep asking and openly asking whether the movements shaped by specific mobility regimes are just to various groups of research workers. Just like treat, think of it, of these movements as a question of justice or injustice. Uh, 
and whether they're just get really for to various groups of workers instead of the kind of idealized, highly individualized uh, type. And uh, what could be done to make these movements more so, more just. And uh, so I just leave with the thought that might, there might be new possibilities in changing the governance of these movements if we approach it through the lens of injustice uh, more forcefully. So thank you.